should be able to understand. Proper comparison of methods. Some of that I have already touched. I'm not sure how much. Uh, let's begin here. You are a reviewer of a manuscript, and the manuscript has somewhere this statement. Method A gets 60%, method B gets 63%. Typically, in this scenario, the author has developed method B, method A has been there before the author developed that paper, and the author wants to publish the paper saying method B, my new method is better. But typically is the statement. But you have to review. These are the numbers you get. Can you make a decision? No, why not? Maybe he found one data set where his method performs better. Okay, so f yeah, there, oh, oh, you, you went, you died many steps into the future. <laughs> uh, well, that's, that's, a, that, oh, that's a tricky one. There's this one, so I tested 1,000 data sets and there's this one where, again, I, I'm not sure that I explained it in this group, but I have seen that too. Uh, I have seen people who have done that actually in publications that were published. But the first thing is, you, I have seen this happen in uh, publication, in uh, manuscripts. Uh, the first question you have to ask is much simpler than what you said. Is it actually the same percentage? So we are putting two numbers and you immediately assume that the author and then there's a word accuracy, a performance, or whatever it's called, Q3, is it really the same, the same thing? And you have to really go back if they quote from a different paper, uh, is it really true that they defined it in the same way? So that's the statement of one. Surprisingly often that in fact the answer turns out to be not. So now we get into the next thing that's implicit in what you said. Uh, is it the same data set? So, you, that is also something you said. It's the same data set, but it just shows such that my, that my method does different. But at least you, in, in that statement, you already tick this off, yes, it is the same data set. But very often it's not. Because very often the author has developed a method for some data set from today, and has taken a quotation for method A, 60%, from a paper, from some data set that existed five years ago. So, very often it's not the same data set. Okay? And then you cannot compare. But let's assume that the scenario is the following. Now, what, what the authors tell you, uh, both methods use 100 proteins, both the same 100 proteins, both use random splits. Both take one for training and one for testing. What you see here is the answer for the hard of testing. Okay? So, is that okay? Um, no, because the randoms are maybe even for one other expression. Exactly, because they are read by this definition, there's a random choice, which means that in fact what you compare these two methods on is a different data set. So it could be, the, so you, you, you assume that the word is bad. But it could just be a coincidence, right? They could have just chosen, again, if you pick from a Gaussian distribution a small number, then most likely two picks, one will have be more the higher end of the Gaussian and one will be on the lower end of the Gaussian. So the most, not the most likely, again, it depends on how I, how I formulate that. But if you, if you have a Gaussian with 10,000 proteins in the PDV and you pick 100, and then you pick two random halves of these 100, most likely one of them has a higher average than the other in most of these picks. Okay? So that is why you have to in fact compare them based on the same protocol. So they both have to use every single protein in the outset exactly once. Okay? Not oversampling, because then you again have the issue that ones that sort of work better could have been uh, used more often. Uh, but that gets me to this next issue. Is it okay to split between training and testing instead of random? Or just choose randomly what you want to split? No, why not? Was that a no or you, you, you just had to move your head a little bit? <sighs> Both. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so do the other direction now. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think it's not because the distribution of the, the states we're testing. Ah, that's coming. 
that's good. Uh, so in my secondary structure, uh, so that is training and that is testing. Uh, so in the secondary structure case, one, I, it's not quite true, but I'm going to simply do it because it's simpler. Uh, the numbers add up. So the three states are 50% other, 20% E, and 30% E. So this is a little bit higher, this is a little bit higher, this is a little bit lower. Uh, now, a random subset, just like the same paper with a Gaussian, with a Gaussian, a random subset, most likely, if, if, if I randomly split into a training and testing, most likely they will have slightly different distributions with respect to that. This also is another aspect of random selections of the Gaussians. That's why I started with 1.82 example on uh, my board. Uh, true. Now, now we get into another subtle thing. And that's the question of representativeness. Let's revise why we do cross validation at the first part. The pi in, in these images here always represents all the data. In machine learning, we do cross validation because we want to establish how well the machine works for data that we will have tomorrow, not today. For that, we take some fraction of the data, hide it under the table, present, pretend we don't know it, and this is supposed to present tomorrow. If it is supposed to present tomorrow, then what I have today must be representative. How could you check whether the data that you have today is representative? What could you do? It's not easy and there's no clear answer. But can you think about ways in which you can at least sort of probe your data? Any idea? Do you have one? Oh, okay. Uh, somebody who was on their last semester. But why, why don't you say something? Do you remember every single one? So everything I say, you remember? I remember everything, but... So I... The baby fish. I like someone like you in my ear then, so that I remember it next year. Yeah? Okay. Yes, so we put um, a bit away and then um, just performance and then put something less away and then see how the curve goes, like when it's separate. Well, that is what you would typically use in order to say, uh, to, uh, that is the kind of thing that you would do in order to respond to the question, is my data sufficient? So for my machine learning, or for my particular solution, do I have enough data? And one way of doing that is if I have the data, uh, just, you know, it's just do half here, so I throw away half of the training set, and I get the same performance, then it sort of looks like any the other half of the training data set will not do much. And then I sort of I throw away part of the data set, and this is one way to sort of figure out, is your data set large enough? You make it smaller and smaller and smaller, as long as you can still do it. Conversely, if for half you have much lower data, so then you have to sort of uh, what Pia was talking about also is getting, adding a little bit of the data and seeing how much you improve. If you see strong improvements, then you're clearly in the, in the realm where you don't have enough data. So by adding data, the more you improve by adding data, the more you know that every bit that you add is really crucial, which means once you get to the, the full half, most likely you still don't have enough, as long as you have a clear growth. Yes? Mm. This part where uh, removing or adding is just on the testing set. No, in the training set. In the training set. Okay. So in this particular case, I assume that we can you uh, to do this right. You may, you you have to do it in a, in a more thorough way. But the first simple, uh, most of those kind of things are what you will not try in the full cross validation. This will be the kind of thing where you sort of try to get a sense for. How well is the problem that you have in front of you solved by the kinds of things that, by the type of input, by the type of machine learning, and, and, and. and the simplest way would really be to freeze the test set and just play with the training set size and see how much information you really need. But it's not quite giving you the answer how re representative is the data that I have today? Will, the will, will it be for tomorrow? It is related, but you have to. 
so if, if again, if your idea is slice, if, if I give three points to this question, and you say slice, the, 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 the bullet point slice, you get one of three. Slice is good. But what's the next idea? You have to slice right. How could you do it? And again, so the I understand that that where you stand, what I'm doing is I induce learning by heart in you. I, I don't want that. Because in principle the what I what I try to get from you is not memory. So if you don't remember what you what, what I told you last year, this is for this in this particular context good. But what I'd like to induce is that you really understand it. And then sort of you can rediscover it by yourself. Trust your senses. Uh, how could you do It's much more important, yeah? Um, you could maybe use the data from like two years ago and... You need to label it. So slice and label. So that's the next point. So you could sort of ask... Uh, okay, now if I only use the, the data from two years ago, uh, is that giving me the same as the data that was added? It's in some sense it's similar. Do I have separation? But now that is the slice statement that you made. But now the label of the time tells me, well, the more recent data, was that actually different? So if I trained on the data less than two years ago, or I trained on more than two years ago, would that actually, on average, give the same? Or is the more recent data really different? Now, if the more recent data is really different, then what you know is, well, my data somehow is representative. You don't know how to fix it. But at least you know something. Okay, you know, you know that you have to be more careful. Uh, you have to put a warning sign up, a warning flag. More recent data looks different from, from older data that may imply that there is something that's going to come over the next years that will you look different again. Okay? That's one way of doing it. Conversely, if you find that whether you use the data from two years ago or the data from, from the last two years does not make a difference, the problem really is the size, and this is again the slicing that she started, that Pierre was talking about, then at least you know that over the last years the data has been represented. You still don't know would it, would it be like that in the future, but you know if it hasn't changed over the last five or ten years. Just that the number is different. So uh, then this is one thing to know. Then we have we have examples, and that, that's the story that Pierre yeah, also refers to. Uh, we have examples where we know that our data set is too small, uh, but we don't have more data. Right? That's the end. We only can say our data set is too small. Uh, Okay, so the moment, however, we accept that our data is representative, or we say our data is not representative, now at the moment of saying our data is not representative, you have two choices. You can say, okay, end. I will not work on it because I know that the data of the last three years has changed. Most likely this will not be a solution. Most likely you will say, well, then I'm sort of going to try to see whether the last three years is, is enough. Or whether there are things that I can learn from both somehow combine them. There's a variety of things. But ultimately you will come, and I should not have wiped it out, you will come ultimately to the point where you somehow say the pi I use is somehow representative. Okay? Uh, at least you may put there is some there are some issues as a as an exclamation mark or as a pointer or as, as a memory. Uh, but you assume that it's somehow representative. And now we get to the issue. Is random splitting okay? Uh, and ultimately, the most important point is not this one. The most important point is this one, the homology story. So, in the blue, you have pairs of proteins that have similar structure. My device that I develop is developed for proteins that are different from the proteins we have, that I, we have today. So, essentially, what we're trying to do is get into this region here. This is the part, the blue, where we, have, where we can map things to the PDB. That's where we can predict structure. That's where comparative modeling works. We want a secondary structure prediction to work somewhere down here, but we cannot map it to something that we know. That means we have to somehow test it in that environment. That means that between training and testing set, it cannot be true that one of them is in training set and one in testing set if it's blue. So between training and testing set, we need the separation. They need to be below the blue line. Okay. The moment they are below the blue line, now I would argue you can randomly select. 
If they're above the blue line, you have to cross some out. If you need them for training because you don't have enough numbers, you have to be very careful how you choose them. So anything, any pair that is blue cannot be at the same time training and testing. Uh, now, back to Martin's point. So you do change the, the averages slightly by looking at random distributions, but not in fact constraining the distribution. That's what you could do as well. In my view, this is okay because you don't quite know how, how the number will be in front of all. So for random subsets, if that's the whole thing, half of it or whatever number that is sort of close to a third, or whatever, this, this is like a large pick. So in my case, I had 20 million men measured and I had 100 picks. Here, I have 1,000 proteins uh, and I have 300 picks. So this is much closer to the full set than the, the 100 in the middle. Uh, so in that set, I mean, if the, the, the tiny differences that remain then, that come, are the ones that sort of are actually realistic. In that sense, I would actually say this is a uh, wanted feature, this level of difference. Because it's not the level of difference of the 100 versus 1 million. Uh, or at least of, uh, on the level of uh, my, my situation, the set that I have for me is representative of tomorrow. So in that sense, it's the truth. Okay? The tiny deviations from the truth are still the truth in that sense. Uh, okay, so we have to make sure that they don't overlap. Now, assume that all of these conditions are met. It's the same measures, the same data set, they all use the same proteins, there was no overlap, nobody used anything for training that overlap. Uh, we have that difference. But again, yes, for some people from the last semester, uh, this has been there before. It's so important in my view that, that I repeat it. So the question is, A, 60%, B, 63%. The difference is 3 percentage points. Is that significant? So there are two words. So they're scientifically significant and statistically significant. Those of you who have not been in the course last year, what do you, do you associate with that? And again, please understand that by addressing the subgroup here that doesn't know the answer, I do not expect you to know the answer. Just what I want to tap into is your intuition. The subgroup of those who have not been there in the last semester is very small. So everybody has to sort of be ready to give an answer. You say statistical significance? Statistical. What is statistical significance? Uh, How do you get it but, but you're right. But ultimately, uh, your association with. Let, let's just leave it there. Your association with statistical is we can take a threshold. Scientific is sort of more complex. And I believe that statement in itself is true. So, uh, scientific, scientifically insignificant is the assumption, however, that you, from your scientific understanding, from your scientific expertise, you can say that some, some differences matter and some don't. In that sense, it is still, if you want to call it that way, a threshold. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. So in that sense, scientifically significant still is a, is a threshold in the sense that you want, you, you should be at. Let me give you an example. I have two methods. A, predict secondary structure Q3 of 30%. B, at 35%. The difference in this particular case is 5 percentage points. I will say, scientifically, there is no difference between these two methods. Why? And just for the sake of the argument, these numbers have been done on 10,000 proteins. It was not a small data set. I say there is no difference between method A, doing 30%, and method B, doing 35. 
Why do I say that? And that's scientifically significant. Thank you. 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 Thank
Method B is 20 years older. Is it still better? Okay, you turn it around. You're the reviewer, I'm the author, I write. Okay, my new method is. Uh, my, 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 my method is actually method, method A. It's actually worse statistically, blah, 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 but my method is new. That one is 20 years old. Well, why are you looking at me like that? You're young, you're supposed to be okay with this sort of, sort of reasoning. So some people seem to not quite get what I'm asking. The age of the method should not play a role. That's absolutely right. Uh, but there is something to be said. Uh, and that ultimately is if one method, the older method, is better on a new data set, the new method has most likely used those new data set on some fraction. 20 years old means most of the data was not used for method B, right? Uh, so method A, however, has sort of had access to a new data. That means that actually the difference is most likely even more higher. Because the, the lower method, in fact, may have used some of the data implicitly, somehow for optimization, the old one not. So this, if anything, it strengthens uh, method B. But Here's another story that we could try. Since one method is so old, we could in fact also try, or this is something that you can always try, use what I call pre-release set. So the idea is, today you start a project, you begin to collect your data. And in the master thesis, after five months, you reach the point where you get to the real numbers, to the real comparisons. And in these five months, some proteins have been added to the database. You could see for these sum proteins, or at least the ones in those sum that are new to yours, so that have no secret similarity to yours, how well would your method do? And how well would other methods that are published do? Because all of those have not seen those. Okay? The problem typically is that you get very high standard errors because you typically get rather small data sets. But at least you get an independent new uh, way to do it and actually cross ship yourself. Okay, here's a different way of uh, thought or way of arguing. Uh, and in all of these points now, I always assume that the standard error, uh, whatever follows the standard error, is less than 0.5. Meaning that all the differences that I show on the whiteboard, integer differences are statistically significant, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, I should have put the plus minus, I didn't do it just to simplify the main point that I want to make on this uh, each slide. Uh, but just for completeness, I put it here, the standard error uh, is plus minus 0.5, meaning that, that any of those are, are even simpler, 0.1. So all of these differences are clearly significant. Okay, so you see that the author is, or the, the master student, you supervise the PhD student, uh, has a final table one, and the final table one, she says, he says, I have three different versions. One has 15 hidden units, one 30, one 45. I tested, I went on in my test, I sort of condensed my data. I don't show you because it gets worse here or worse here. Those are some of the most interesting candidates from all my uh, analysis. And what is the best method is the one with 30 hidden units. That is wrong. Why?
Ausführung. So this number is on the test set. Yes. Yeah, well, let's turn that around. What did you understand that? That we are on the training set? Yeah, it's Can you use them? Yes. No. Because you could have completely all the training. Yeah, that's fine. So if, if that would have been the, the result, so the training set actually is something that is remarkably uninteresting. It's only becoming interesting if you cannot at all train. So that again brings us back to some of the issues Pierre was talking about. Is my data set large enough? And then you try to overtrain and see whether you can really learn it. But for anything else, the training so the performance on the training set is something that's completely uninteresting. That you find in machine learning journals, but not in real life. Uh, so if you again, if you would do this on the training set, you would tend to sort of just select the one that is mostly overtrained. That's exactly not what you want to do. So it cannot be on the training set. So no, I never said it's on, it's on the testing set, uh, but it could not have run on the training set, so it must, must have been on the test set. Uh, so the train set, put it differently. Uh, you have two options here, that the numbers are for the training set for the testing set. Uh, the training set is total nonsense. Then you should have jumped up and said that is total nonsense when you're on the training set. Anyway, uh, but it's again, Daniel, I'm sort of trying to provoke in you, for yourself or for all of you, whenever you understand something, Try to, it's not easy, but try to write down for you what you understand, every single detail. Sometimes you stumble over things that you could have understood in a different way. Uh, but this is, this is the trick in science. I mean, there is the discovery of it. There is no solution. But anyway, so let's get back to it. Uh, so this is wrong. Why? Yes. Um, because you said that your um, biometer, um, um, you shouldn't just run it just on the test set. So one way of doing it again, uh, there are many, many different words you use, the word validation. Uh, so some people call this validation and this test, some people call this test and this validation. I, I introduce my own words because they're more intuitive to me. So I like the word cross-training simply because it sort of gives, gives a way that what we're talking about is another thing that sort of optimizes. Okay? It's still part, the green one here, I call it cross-training, is still part of, of optimization procedure. While this is the thing that is really under the end, under the table. And, okay, in this particular case, so what I show here now is the cross-training set. Okay? And that is the one you should do with, on the cross-training set. Now, in this particular case, you would make a decision that the 30 hidden units is the best. And now, having done the 30 hidden units, you would PC, politically correct or scientifically correct, is you decide it's this one and you run the test set only on this one, nothing else. Okay, that's the way you have to do it. Many of us cannot bear that. Uh, they will actually look for the others also. Okay, this is my second person, my third person. I actually like to know how they perform on the test set, right? Many will do that. It's not proper, but we are human. Uh, and the human aspect is part of science. It's part of what makes science strong. Don't, don't cut this out. Uh, now, you find that in fact, somehow, the numbers are inverse. So suddenly 45 in terms of test set is better than 30. What do you do? What do you write up? So the abstract, you will put both. The yeah, abstract you will choose, a, choose one of those. Which one? If you want to do it scientifically correct, you think you should take the what preferred to do this one. This one. Because you know me. You know what I want to hear, right? You want to make me happy. <laughs> uh, why, why is that scientifically more correct? Because otherwise, um, you use the test set. To, uh, you violate this simple statement that the test set is to be used only for estimating the number from your decision. And that is exactly what you do. You, you sort of follow the recipe. You choose, you make the decision on the cross training set, you say this one, and then you compile this number and you ignore everything else. In fact, now you may not even publish this company. You should actually not even publish that. 
Uh, you may then say, okay, I made the decision here, in my cross training set, when glancing at the test set, which I shouldn't have done, I realized something weird is going on. I do not know what it means, but I still stand by that solution because that is the only solution that I did independent of looking at the table. If I've now switched my, my decision, then I would optimize my decision to the test set. And that would put me into the position where maybe my decision here is right for what I see today, but not for what I see tomorrow. The best simulation of what I see tomorrow is really this one. Right? And then that is the best estimate. In fact, this is lower. So I assume I learned from this that my 64 here is likely an overestimate. I learned that from the comparison of these two columns, I learned that testing is always lower. So there is something going on here. I have some overtraining. I pretend that my results for the cross training are completely independent. It's not quite true because those are consistently higher than, than the one for the testing. So something is going on, I don't know what it is, and I put, may put that into the paper. I may write this. Uh, but I stick to this number. Okay. Uh, you should do this uh, for a variety of, of measures. Remember, we briefly discussed this issue, the simple signal structure prediction method, since roughly 50% here are in the state other, the simple signal structure prediction method will always predict other. So you have to make sure that other values, for instance, per performance of beta strand, performance of alpha helices, you have to repeat the whole thing. For repeating the whole thing, you will not do the cross validation differently. You just will, will do the measure. Okay, any other question? On this, then we begin with the membrane. Story. Uh, so, what to put around a, a, a membrane? Uh, what to put around a cell and uh, a lipid bilayer? Uh, 
So most drug targets target uh, membrane-associated proteins. Uh, why? Why do most drugs target the proteins on the membrane? Well, the further you target things that happen, so typically it's a signaling cascade, right? Somebody comes in uh, and starts a cascade of actions or reactions of things that happen to the cell, processes. And if you want to have any downstream process, you have to sort of manipulate more. Once you, you stand on the, on the membrane, you essentially stand on the first line of defense before the, whatever it is, the, what you want to attack even comes in. So the further on the outside, the more you attack on the membrane, the, the, the safer you are. So there are different types of proteins, um, transmembrane proteins. This is just one subset of these proteins. And you see what they all, you may see what they all have in common, are alpha helices. So all these proteins go through the lipid bilayer with alpha helices. And you also, in all these cases here, the lipid bilayer is essentially lying here, so the two lipids are facing in that direction, uh, meaning that all of those essentially are orthogonal to the lipid bilayer, the helices, right? Uh, you see some examples where there is a little bit more of an angle uh, here, but then many of them are, uh, here's also a little bit more of an angle, but many of them are fairly orthogonal. Um, here you have more examples, you often see that there's a mushroom structure up there. Mushroom structure, this is simply the protein aggregation. Uh, and here they are condensed. Uh, these are sitting in the lipid. These are sort of the ones that are lying here, are lipid attached, typically. Uh, now, in terms of comparative modeling, most drug targets are against membrane proteins. And that is roughly, so this is the whole slide, uh, this is roughly the fraction of proteins for which we can do compare or put at some point do comparative modeling for memory proteins, the blue one. Uh, so again, I told you at some point that when you when you wait, comparative modeling gets better all the time. And I showed you this for global proteins briefly, and there was a substantial increase over time. When you look at memory proteins at least uh, the, over, over those years, you see that the improvement is much less impressive. It has changed slightly, but it's still fairly low. So the observation remains, most drug targets are membrane proteins. Statement number one. Statement number two. Uh, so drug target, uh, drug is, drugs are very important, membrane proteins are very important. Statement number two. For the vast majority of membrane proteins, we do not know the structure, we cannot determine the structure by comparative model. So for those, structure is very easy to get. Statement number three. In order to have a drug, you need a structure. So the incentive to get membrane protein structures is very high. Why? Why do these things come together? Why is it that we have so few? Or we have such a high interest? So we should have many, many more. Why not? Any idea? Yeah. Maybe the structure is only that way when the protein is attached to the membrane. That's exactly the point. So the problem really is, you see in this, in this sort of mushroom kind of thing, it looks as if there's some sort of stress or push or they are pushed together. Uh, the moment you want to do a structure, you remove the lipids, boom, the thing falls apart. So you have a situation of a molecule that is happy in the membrane, and you have to try to get the, the structure with the lipid. It's very complicated. And in fact, to get those, the, the membrane structures that we have are typically those that are so densely found in the membrane that you could just scoop them out of a living cell and you get almost a crystal. Those structures we have. But for most, this is extremely difficult. This is also why, why almost any major membrane protein that people get a new structure for important, such as GPCRs, could be a little price. Uh, they're just very, very difficult. Has been, there have been many breakthroughs recently, uh, but it remains still, still very difficult. 
Okay, here is a very simplified view of the task that we have in order to predict membrane proteins. First of all, we have to say this is a membrane protein as opposed to it's not. So it's a protein that, in fact, so there are different types of membrane proteins. Some are just anchored. We will ignore them in this lecture. Uh, we will only consider proteins for which a region goes through the membrane. So they have a region outside or on the outside of the membrane, on the inside of the membrane. Shown here is simply the secretary of the extracellular space and cytoplasm. Uh, and so we have transmembrane segments. And in the beginning here, I will focus on uh, transmembrane helices. And what we want to predict is where is the helix? So, first of all, the protein has transmembrane helices, so it's transmembrane protein. Secondly, where is the helix? And thirdly, which part of the protein is where? So does it start, does the protein start at the extracellular part or at the intracellular part? Uh, and that gets us into TMH prediction. So let's, at the end of the day, uh, there's an H, there's a helix. So we have a secondary structure of H, right? We could just do what we had before. We apply the method that we trained to predict secondary structure. And here's what that would get uh, for one particular example. So there are Admittedly, some examples of proteins that were better. Uh, this happened to have been a, a, a few years ago uh, from Paul Wüthrich, by the way, Thomas uh, Shikursky. I've never noticed that. Uh, so he got a Nobel Prize on uh, developing the NMR technology. Uh, so this pentapeptide is not a full protein, or a pentapeptide here, uh, in NMR in solution has a long helix. And it's predicted by the device I showed you before to be indestructible. So it's not quite 100% wrong, but it's pretty close to 100% wrong. Yeah. You could not do, it's difficult to beat the, 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 mis, the amount of mistake that this method made. Uh, okay, so why is that? Well, one way to explain this is that in a membrane, you have to be hydrophobic on the outside. And the protein is the other way around. So somehow we have trained this device on proteins where inside meant hydrophobic, outside hydrophilic. And now we test it on proteins where somehow the opposite is the case. Maybe that is the problem. Uh, and actually, whether that is the problem or not remains unclear. But the only way to attack that problem is by, in fact, retraining or redoing it. But the simplest way to predict membrane reaches would be what? If, if you looked at the next slide, the answer was sort of hidden way on the next slide. But it was not so easy that just looking at it would find it. Well, any suggestion? And given... Uh, 